Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'd just like to acknowledge my uh, co-authors, um, uh, Mark Sells from the University Hospital in Nottingham, and uh, Henrik uh, Kaleen and um, Catherine Sadlin from the Complete uh, Vocal Institute in uh, Copenhagen. So what is intentional distortion? Well, as its name suggests, it's actually something you intend to do to add a distorted sound onto a singing, uh, um, onto a singing tone. And we had a very nice example of it last night at the, uh, the conference dinner uh, with uh, Uri, who, who gave a, a masterful uh, performance of it uh, amongst uh, his many uh, effects. But in, in case uh, some of you can't remember last night, um, I thought I'd uh, play, play just a little uh, example of uh, a singer who uh, used to do it uh, regularly before, sadly, he, he died, um, not of... Uh, doing too much distortion, I need to uh, hasten to add. Um, but uh, he, sung, he sings this song called uh, Don't Talk to Strangers. Uh, and there's one line in it uh, where uh, he says the word down, and that's a nice example of distortion. So I'll just play that. And if any of you uh, uh, want to hear more, then you can go on to the YouTube uh, videos there. You can hear that sort of grating sound uh, um, uh, that we heard last night and uh, very nicely. So it's, uh, it's an effect uh, out of many that are used uh, in rock music. But there's not a lot that's been actually published on the, on the subject. Um, Dr. Tietz, uh, um, uh, needless to say, has published on most aspects of, uh, of voice. And um, I came across this abstract in uh, Jazza in 1998. Uh, when he mentioned uh, uh, distortion um, and talked about a periodic vibration of the vocal folds and desynchronizing the uh, primary oscillators or engaging secondary oscillators. I don't have any details about what he, uh, um, what he actually did in the, the presentation. The only other paper that I've, I've come across was one in LPV uh, with uh, Zanger Borsch, who's actually a, a singer uh, himself, um, and uh, with Johann Sundberg, they um, did a study with uh, inverse filtering, and they showed that there was a, a pulse amplitude was due to aperiodic and periodic vibration of the supraglottic mucosa. And the tones contained aperiodicity, uh, there was lots of variation in the, uh, the contact quotient, and it was produced at quite, how, uh, quite loud sound pressure levels. Um, at a previous uh, PVOC uh, meeting, we gave a, uh, a demonstration uh, of uh, various different types of uh, vocal effects. And uh, I think um, uh, it's, it's now agreed, certainly amongst uh, rock singers, that there's more than one type of uh, a vocal effect, um, and they can be subclassified. Catherine uh, Sadlin um, runs the Vocal Institute uh, uh, in Copenhagen, and they have a pedagogic technique where you, uh, all the singers are trained in uh, basically getting the essentials right of support and twang, it's a necessary twang, and avoiding producing the jaw. And then she talks about four different modes, which are the, like the gears of the voice. And uh, <clears throat> she used these terms primarily because uh, some of the traditional terminology was confusing and, uh, <clears throat> and also didn't quite um, uh, <clears throat> match up, um, it didn't help the singers particularly. Um, so you have these four uh, modes of singing and you can alter the sound color and then once you've got that established you can add on any effect that you like and one of them is this intentional distortion. You can have a rattle which you've identified as more involving the, the uh, mucosa over the arytenoids and growl, where it's the aryepiglottic folds that are mostly involved, and grunt, which we had another example last night, where you have the whole of the supraglottis uh, uh, vibrating. But I'm going to focus on distortion. The aim of our study was to better understand what was actually caused, what happened in the larynx. Um, and we used uh, laryngostroboscopy um, uh, with a videoscope uh, for that. And then the second study we did was to look at the interaction of the supraglottic vibration during ID, uh, intentional distortion, and vocal, vi vocal fold vibration. So was there an effect uh, of the uh, supraglottic vibration on 
the vocal fold, because a lot of people think that this type of singing is unhealthy. And if you could demonstrate that there was actually reasonable, uh, <coughs> there wasn't, a, this was, um, the vocal folds were relatively unimpeded uh, during the production of this, then that may add some, give some evidence that it was safer. So we used uh, EGG and the acoustic recording with the Speech Studio program for that. So um, I went over to, to Copenhagen and Catherine managed to round up uh, 20 willing singers uh, who uh, kindly agreed to and consented to uh, uh, obviously take part in this, uh, this study. So the first one, we used the laryngograph processor. Um, the patients were, uh, sorry, the subjects uh, were all uh, um, examined with a video scope uh, using the Olympus system. And we used the laryngograph, laryngostrobe as the trigger for, their, uh, for, for the light. And uh, we looked at the EGG, acoustic and video stroboscopy images. Uh, it was an observational study uh, where we, um, <clears throat> we checked that the, the modes were produced uh, uh, correctly uh, with and without the distortion. And uh, we used a previous uh, assessment form to actually go through the images and look at exactly what was changing. And two of us rated it and we came to a consensus agreement. This was the type of uh, uh, examination uh, of the images that we used. Uh, the, basically, this is uh, the first um, uh, one here is what we call neutral. Um, this is curbing, this is overdrive, and that is uh, edge. Um, and uh, these are the parameters we looked at, the, glottal, uh, the shape of the glottis, uh, the position of the false chords, the um, anterior posterior narrowing, and the, um, also uh, the shape of the piriform fossa. And what, when we not only did we look at what was changing between using the mode and the mode with distortion, uh, we wanted to look at what was actually vibrating. And although you know, it was a, a periodic type of vibration we were expecting, you can still see uh, movement. So this is just some uh, still examples of um, <clears throat> uh, the, two, uh, the four modes with and without distortion. And the most obvious thing is, uh, for instance, for the neutral mode, uh, which is the, uh, um, the lighter of the, uh, the various modes, if you like. Uh, you can see that the larynx seems to be coming up. The position of the scope was kept stable on the nose. Um, and you can see that the false chords seem to be coming in here. There's some anterior, posterior narrowing, and there's loss of the piriform fossa. And you can see this uh, with each of the images uh, there, with the overdrive here, um, and this is the edge here. And you can see the progressive sort of uh, narrowing of the supraglottic structures with those modes and additional narrowing uh, with the uh, distortion. So I'll just pay you a short example uh, of this. This is going through the various modes with and without distortion. <laughs> and you can see the false chords vibrating. last one was edge and you can see the green trace um, uh, to the right uh, was uh, the laryngograph change. You can say, see very distinctive wave patterns uh, for those different types of, uh, of modes. Um, so simply uh, looking at the images uh, we confirm basically that the false chords were vibrating, uh, there was medial lateral constriction, anterior posterior narrowing, the larynx was rising, there was narrowing of the posterior lateral pharyngeal wall. Um, and this was the, the ranking and the number of uh, the subjects that we used. Uh, sorry, the, the, only 15 of the subjects could actually uh, um, had images that we could analyze for this uh, particular study. So the second uh, study was just uh, simply um, recording the ELG signal with the acoustic signal and using the speech studio program for the analysis. This is the type of uh, uh, um, output you get with the, uh, the program. And you can see uh, this is the spectrogram. Uh, with, this is actually with overdrive. Uh, here you can see 
the spectrum changes when you add in distortion, so overdrive again, and distortion. This is the speech signal. You can see the gross changes in the laryngograph signal, how the amplitude of it goes down in general. This is the FX trace, the green one here, um, and you can see it's fairly uh, uh, level, um, but you can see that the purple one, which is the contact quotient, uh, is uh, a little uh, variable here, and then it seems to sort of break up a little bit here uh, during the distortion. And this is a magnified view of, uh, of, the, of the point here in the middle of the overdrive. You can see a nice regular waveform, and this is just the sound example. Okay. And this is uh, looking at uh, a section uh, in the distorted element, and you can see that the obvious thing is that the, uh, the baseline here of the, uh, the, way, uh, the waveform is uh, unstable, and the peak, there's peak variation uh, here, and possibly some, uh, the size, uh, the width of the uh, waveform is, is different. So we um, analyzed um, segments of the distortion and, uh, uh, sorry, the overdrive, sorry, all the modes, uh, with and without distortion, and we had two examples of each. Uh, we, uh, the sample size was about, um, uh, just about under 470 uh, milliseconds, and from that we obtained about 165 uh, periods uh, which we could analyze. These are the measures uh, that uh, the Speech Studio program, uh, the multi-dimensional uh, voice profile measures that, um, that are associated with the Speech Studio program. And I'll just go into those in a little bit more detail. These, they're called FX rather than F0 because they're actually uh, based on the laryngograph uh, waveform as opposed to the acoustic signal. Um, and uh, so you can measure the uh, mean FX, the standard deviation of the FX, which you've heard, or F0, uh, as we heard uh, um, earlier this afternoon, uh, the contact quotient and the standard deviation of the contact quotient. Uh, jitter factor, shimmer plus, uh, the CPP and the uh, NNE. And um, uh, these, this is the results of the three-way uh, ANOVA for factors of sex, mode, and intentional distortion based on these parameters. Um, as you can uh, see and you would expect, for instance, for the sex uh, gender uh, here, that the, there's a significant difference, obviously, with men having deeper voices. Uh, and all these parameters are lower uh, in men compared to women. There is some uh, variation uh, depending on the modes, and this is usually related to the extremes of the modes, like the neutral and the edge. And I'm not going to go into too much detail about that at the moment. But the intentional dis dis uh, distortion uh, here, um, what is interesting, I think, is that the, the mean FX does not change at all, whether you're, you've got the mode or a mode with distortion, so that's fairly stable. And also, the mean contact quotient is not changing either. But what is changing is the standard deviation of both of those. And uh, as we heard earlier, it's sort of like a perturbation measure of the, both the frequency and the contact quotient. The actual uh, jitter factors and shimmer uh, were statistically different for, for uh, with and without distortion and uh, uh, the uh, sound pressure level was higher um, with distortion as well. And as again, you'd expect the uh, normalized noise energy and CPP were, uh, were different. So this is just a, a little bit more detail about um, <clears throat> uh, those values. And you can see um, for males and females here, you can see there's a difference between the standard deviation of the FX. Uh, so that's with the mode, and these are the values uh, with, with distortion here. Uh, interestingly, the, uh, the shimmer plus um, was no different between males and females, uh, but of, as I mentioned already, uh, there was an increase with, uh, uh, with distortion. Uh, for the normalized noise energy uh, measures, there was a significant uh, uh, increase in the uh, um, uh, of, the, of the noise in the signal, and the CPP uh, measure uh, was uh, significantly reduced as well. So, in conclusion, um, I think reasonably clear now uh, how it's produced. It's, there's definitely some uh, medial lateral constriction of the false cords 
associated with some anterior posterior narrowing, and I think this probably causes some flaccidity actually in the false cords, um, which allows it to then uh, become uh, involved with the, uh, in the vibration. Uh, the vibration um, does uh, <coughs> on the uh, false cords is certainly uh, um, uh, is, is mostly aperiodic although we've used some high-speed uh, imaging uh, recently, and there's sometimes a very complex uh, uh, periodic pattern that you can see that comes in from time to time. Um, the vocal folds continue to vibrate underneath, uh, but there's an increased frequency, amplitude, and contact quotient uh, perturbation, possibly induced by the false chords themselves. And then obviously there's an increased noise element in the sound signal. But the, the other interesting thing is that the uh, harmonic structure of the mode is actually preserved uh, throughout this. So this is an added sound to an underlying uh, uh, mode. Thank you very much.